you raise absolutely a really important point about potential unequal distribution of an estate. Mm -hmm. This is an area of high conflict. This is where the conflict arises. Welcome back, everybody, to the Farms in BC podcast. Today, we have two special guests, Perminder Tung and Tim Greer from Lindsay Kenny Law. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, well, today we're going to be discussing everything related to estate planning. So, uh, Perminder, Tim, could you guys tell me a little bit about yourselves, about the law firm, and why you guys have chosen this line of uh, law to practice? Okay, well, I'll start. I've been a lawyer for 25 years now. Um, I joined Lindsay Kenny in 2011, and I gradually realized that this is an area I like a lot. So it just was a natural. I like uh, working with people. I like uh, talking. I like hearing what people are up to, and I like sorting out how to get things done. So uh, solicitor's practice really suited me. And this particular area of law is, is something I've grown to enjoy more and more. Did you always start off at this line or did you focus on something else prior to this? No, uh, I, uh, before I joined Lindsay Kenny, I was uh, part litigator, part solicitor. I okay. was with a much smaller firm. Yeah. So I was jumping back and forth and uh, it's much better with this firm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My name is Perminder Tong, also a partner at Lindsay Kenny. And been there for 15 years and I'm a career litigator. So a lot of courtroom litigation and advocacy. And what I noticed was as the baby boomer generation is starting to pass and pass their generational wealth over to their children, we're headed into a time where there's a lot of conflict. People that haven't done a lot of planning, mm -hmm. people that didn't want to talk about death. So what ends up happening is you have estates that are kind of messy and messy means litigation. So we are involved to try to help these people resolve their disputes. And if they can't, you end up in court. And we have decisions coming out of the court that, you know, start to distribute the estate. Maybe not necessarily how the parent, the person originally planned or thought they would have done it. That's interesting. That's interesting. We should definitely dive deep into that topic as well. So estate planning is very important to a lot of my clients, um, a lot of farmers in general. Uh, if you look at their uh, portfolio, uh, their net worth, it's quite significant. Um, their net worth has significantly increased over the last 30, 40 years. So that's all due to property value. So what role does a lawyer play in creating an estate plan? Well, you want to get to know the client. You want to find out about the family dynamic. You want to know who's who in the family zoo. Uh, you want to know how they're working together. Are they working together? Who's active in the farm? Who's not active in the farm? Um, who's taken a managerial role? And who has just been the worker bee? Yeah. Often there's a parent with parents with a, a number of children. And until you have a feel for who is actually going to be the successor or successors, that helps a great deal in figuring out the plan. Um, some families, as Perminder was saying, just drift into it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. Or they just say, I, I'll get to it. There's a lot of psychology in, in estate planning. Um, there's a lot of, uh, let's try and sort this out some later date. I'm noticing that more with majority of my clients. Uh, yeah, if I, if I can jump in. So mm. one of the interesting things I hear about is often it's not as easy as they think. They think, let's just prepare a will. And that's the one document yeah. that will help them get through this time of planning. It actually, for a high net worth individual with a variety of different assets or diversified assets, um, they actually need probably an accountant, a CPA with a tax specialty. They probably should be talking to a financial planner, an insurance advisor, because there might be deemed dis dispositions of the property mm -hmm. upon death, which has potential tax consequences. And if it's an operating business, a cannery, those types of things, it may not be the right time to sell for the beneficiaries. So an insurance product would help them deal with 
the tax liability. You're, you're correct there. We've noticed, but to get insurance, if you don't do it at an early stage, it's hard to get insurance. So, so that's, that's what we've seen, right? Yeah. So the, it's this question of, it's not one professional. It involves typically a few. Using the lawyer as your quarterback is what's really helpful to bring these people all together mm -hmm. to have this holistic conversation. Definitely. And then the thing that gets daunting for that planning family is, oh, there's all these, there's all these different people involved. They might have all their different expenses. And we know our farming community is very prudent about their expenses. Definitely. Right? So that comes up in the conversation, right? Yeah. Well, I think it's really important because if you're looking at fee structure versus asset value and planning for generational rollovers, um, the savings is significant if you do it right versus what these fees are. And that's, that's what I explain to a lot of these individuals. Yes. Um, you look at the fee versus your legacy passing on your entire legacy to the next generation and make sure it's done smoothly is more valuable than looking at these fees and hiring the best lawyers, hiring the best accountants, hiring the best insurance advisors. You don't want to leave a fight to your family. Biggest thing, yeah. And we have seen that. Uh, more often than not. Quite a few times. And um, when, when you're working with a family, they say, when, when should we start? I always say yesterday. Okay, Correct. we always should have got going on it. We always should have done it. And, and so if they're in a bit of a muddle, okay, you're in a muddle. Let's work through it. And you work through the muddle and you come up with a plan. And then you say, all right, this is the plan today. Yes. I want you to come back in three or four years. Is it still working? Is it still the right plan? Is it still the, 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 the children you thought would take over the business are still going to be the ones taking over the business? How has it been? Has it gone as you expected? There, there's a couple of families I've worked with over the years who had this absolute definite choice. It's going to be this child who's going to be running it. They've got the capability. They want to do it. And guess what? Four years later, divorce has come. Correct. Well, that's the other challenge with these estate plans. Yep. Um, sometimes you have to roll over some of these assets to the next generation. And now you're exposed to... Yep divorces, splits. And so that is one concern that I actually have with a lot of, um, I can speak for the East Indian community. That's mm -hmm. one reason they don't want to put any of their children onto any of these assets. And, and the other one is that they don't want to talk about it. Yep. They just, they delay the process. Uh, the answer for that often, well, the delay, that's something to work through, <laughs> but the answer, if they don't want to decide, is they have to come up with usually a trust structure whereby there is still discretion vested in them, mm -hmm. but they are going to reach a point where they have to do it. let go and do it. So they have themselves as a first trustee, and then they have their alternate trustee. Mm -hmm. There's a lot riding on the choice of the alternate trustee who takes over from them, whether it's through a family trust or whether it's through a joint spousal trust. Mm -hmm. It has to be someone that you effectively have vetted for a number of years, probably decades. And, and that's a difficult challenge. Oh, yes. Who, how do you, like what we've seen is, we've seen it's always, m most often it's, it's the eldest. Yep. Um, but when it's an operation or business, it's who's most involved fr from, from the point of when the discussions have started, like you mentioned. Um, and like how, you know, that's a big decision. You, you can't make that mistake. Oh, yeah. So what what advice would you have for people out there of like what is the best like parameters to pick an executor? It has to be someone I always say it has to be someone who you trust and whose business uh, decision making you trust. It's a two part test. It's no good if you got the son or daughter with a heart of gold and a head of mush. And there are people out there like that. You have to have the one who can stand up under the pressure. And it's not necessarily the oldest child, son or daughter. Yes, it's being an executor is a daunting task. Um, it's one that involves a lot of uh, responsibility. Um, sometimes people don't even tell that they've, <laughs> they've nominated someone as an executor. So, you know, one good piece of advice is when you do it, make sure you communicate to that person that they are aware that that is the arrangement that, that you've set for for their estate plan yeah. and and they they get paid for some of their work and their effort 
but there is a high level of scru- scrutiny that the beneficiaries will be, you know, placing on that person, right? Because you, what does an executor do? They have to go and get an accounting, an inventory of all of the assets that belong to the estate, literally down to furniture and jewelry and the like. So is, could you dive deep a little bit deeper into like what other role does an executor play? Uh, occasionally the executor is the counselor. <laughs> <laughs> Thought that was the lawyer's job. <laughs> uh, the, exec- the executor is a heavy load, yeah. okay? Um, to go back to what Perminder was talking about, I always say to my clients, talk to your executor to be, if possible, first choice, second choice. And they tell me they have done it. And I found out sometimes they did not. And, uh, or they, they put the plan in the drawer and literally forgot about it for 15 years. 15 years has passed. They have passed. The executor finds out, oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah, I said I'd do that. Yeah. Oh, I'm not doing that. You know, I said I'd do that. It's 15 years later. I've got a health issue. My wife has a health issue. I can't do that. That's a big job. I'm not, no. no yeah, sometimes no. we run into the to the we run into a situation where there's litigation. They walk in and they say they don't want to be the executor anymore and they want to relinquish their responsibilities as an executor. What happens? Hopefully, there's an alternate executor in place yes. that is willing and able to do the work. Yeah. But suppose disaster, no, your executors have died or your executors have just said, nope, I'm renouncing, I'm out, I'm not doing it. And then you have to get a family meeting and say, okay, amongst the greater family, who can do it? So if the family is all in the same basic team, mm-hmm. they will come up with someone pretty quickly. Yeah. But if there's warring factions, then, then we're, we might be off to the litigation route. Just, okay, who's going to do it? So then we're in, we're in court and we're asking the court to appoint someone. Have you ever seen it where they divert it back to legal counsel, say, can you be the executor for the estate? Have you seen that? Well, what's interesting is I think, Tim, a lot of people start asking the lawyer to be the executor. Or, or the accountant sometimes. Yeah. You know, I think in our in my personal situation it's it's our accountant yeah right and uh there's companies that do this stuff out that that are out there uh, there's lots of things people need to talk about and think through um when they want to make that decision i i do act as executor from time to time on some estates um but i always say if you have viable candidates that's better all right and the Institutional solution is to try and use one of the trust companies. The family asks, if, if they're worried about fees, they should be talking to their trust companies and discover what real fees are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's better to do it in the family. Yes. As long as you have the right candidate. First choice, second choice. And if possible, first choice, second choice, third choice. Because you don't know the future. And that's why I say if they can come back every few years and rethink it and to get to your point, how people are reluctant to even go there, each time they do it, it's easier. Yes. It's like learning to swim. Yeah. Okay. I was a terrible swimmer. I still am a terrible swimmer. I learned to swim as an adult, but I'm happy I learned to swim as an adult. It's a useful skill and it's a fun exercise. Now I can't say planning is necessarily a fun exercise, but you'll get better at it the more you do it. And that's true for families, and that's true for lawyers. I'll come back to the to the the fee issue again, right? Because we know that this statement I'm about to make is true, but people struggle to hear it, right? The idea is the amount of potential tax savings and the amount of potential headache that is saved by ensuring things are smooth by documenting the agreements, getting the various planning tools in place, be it a will. Uh, enduring power of attorney, representation agreements, trusts. These are just some words of the types of tools that can be used. Each one of those has a special meaning in estate planning. These are not terribly expensive tools, but as you near end of life or face end of life, the, uh, the smoothness of that process for the next generation is what you're trying to ensure. And at the end of the day, the potential tax savings, right, are, are massive. Quite significant. Um, you know, you mentioned, a t- uh, and this is what I've seen with a lot of 
a lot of individuals that have massed a big net worth, they do it at an age where it's a lot, it's, it's at a later age. I think you have to look at your current position and your net worth and your portfolio. When it's substantial amount, I think that's not really the age you should be looking at. You should be looking at it. Hey, I've got X amount of net worth where I feel that it's significant. I should start this planning. And that goes to my next question is how often should you be updating your estate plan? How often should you be updating your wills? That's a very good question. You should be looking at it every four or five years. Okay. And you should be looking at it whenever something significant happens. And that might be once a decade. It might be every second year. It all depends. I go back to what I said earlier. It depends on how people are getting along within the family, how succession is working for the various children in the family, how the uh, companies are doing, and things change. Do you ever propose to the client, which I haven't really seen, do you propose to the client on every three years? Hey, John, would you like to review your estate, like your your will? Uh, We have it actually systematized at our... Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So our system is um, they sign a form Mm -hmm. at the end of the process saying, here is year one, three, five, seven, ten. What stage, at which stage would you like a reminder, right, from us to review, right? And, you know, they they sign off and we systematize it and a letter goes off at that time frame to remind them. to. And that is awesome because everybody forgets. You might have sold some of those assets. You might have purchased new ones. Positions might have changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think even in our letter, we say something like, has a significant event taken place? And we'll list examples so that they, it triggers them to think about it, right? Yeah, and it brings people back. And if nothing else, at least it brings it to their mind. This is something to consider. This is something we should be thinking about because it's a very big decision uh, how your estate will flow. And suppose you want to do something that perhaps will be controversial after you pass, then you want to make sure that you've arranged your life so that what you wish to happen will happen. That's what this is really all about. Have you arranged your life for how you wish for things to happen, that they will happen that way? And, you know, they've put so much time, effort into the amount of hard work they've put in, how much sacrifice they've done. The last thing you want is, you know, you... You're on your deathbed and this is not organized. Like it's not, what was it really worth it? You know, you know, you're leaving a mess. I know you're leaving a big net worth, but you're also going to be leaving a big, big arguments, fights, or because there's no, there hasn't been a discussion. There hasn't been done any planning. So that's something I always mention to a lot of my clients that don't want to touch on this topic or touch about death is have a family meeting. Mm -hmm. Talk about. The, the what position everyone's going to play even while they're alive and what type of position they want to play after. Somebody might want to move off to the States. Now that, that affects the estate plan. And so having these discussions at an early stage, um, when that, when, if, when and if that happens, yep. everybody knows their part. Everyone knows their position. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, when you, when you asked us to come speak at this uh, podcast, one of the notes I made to myself is um, having a conversation. Like if there's any advice and and you, you nailed it, right? It's about starting that conversation as a family while you're alive. What are your intentions? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? Communication about who is the executor, communication about the various beneficiaries, who you want to run things, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And um, you know, where various assets lie, even small things, jewelry, right? Things of that nature, sentimental (coughs) things. yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know, you asked another question um, about when people think it's appropriate. What if they don't have many assets or it's a very small asset? When is the right time to do estate planning, right? And, and Tim, what would you say to that? If you're down to a situation where you literally have no assets, then it probably doesn't matter. If but, you have a written will or not, is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. But if you have anything of significance, it absolutely matters. It absolutely matters. And the discussion you were talking about, it, you, it's hard for some families because that 
child who really is working out of a sense of duty on the farm, but they really didn't want to do it. They're just doing it because mom and dad said, you have to do it. You must do it. You shall do it. You will do it. Hopefully, they can actually listen for and hear some honesty from their kids. Um, I, I grew up on a farm. I was the fifth child. And my standard joke is my brother stole the farm from me. And all he did was work for 30 years to get it. Right? <laughs> and I would have been a terrible farmer. And I knew I'd be a terrible farmer. And fortunately, I was able to go off to school and have the job I have. Right? But some families don't follow that playbook. And they make sure everybody stays. Well, part of this estate planning discussion is really finding out, is this what your children want to do? key thing is does this is this what your children want to do is what's is this part of their future yeah yeah because if, if you don't do the plan if you don't have the talk after the parents die there's going to be a scattering and there might be a fight yeah. because the one who really did it out of a begrudging loyalty yeah and they say to themselves i'm 45 do i want to do this for another 30 years with my brother that i fight with the answer is no it's far better that that's known early and the family has talked it through and they've let him or her go because that's what's right for them. Or even setting up some sort of additional compensation. Certain activities that they've done on that farm is also going to play a position of raising the value of that farm. Absolutely. So we've seen it where you, uh, that, that responsible child that's the farmer, he took a bare land piece and he probably put blueberries on it. That property value has significantly gone up. They've spent the last 30 years harvesting that crop while the other siblings were off to do, living their dreams or, you know, doing the jobs that they wanted to do and chase. So how do you compensate that? So that's why when we have these discussions and I see somebody sitting there like, like that child that is taking care of everything, that sibling, you know, they want to be compensated for their time. Yeah. They've put their other dreams for the family's in, in best interest first. Yes. You raise Absolutely. a really important point about potential unequal distribution of an estate. Mm -hmm. This is an area of high conflict. This is where the conflict arises. And I think we're going to see that more as um, these the, the baby boomers pass on um, the to next, the next generation. This movement of the biggest transition of wealth in the history of the world is happening, is happening in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Well, now, what have you guys seen um, when they pass it on to the next generation? Have you, are you seeing it, uh, well, in the past, how have you seen it? And now with certain BC laws, how are you seeing it now distributed to the next generation? Well, um, if they've done planning correctly, it's very smooth. If they have not, then there's a fight. Um, if they have appreciated, uh, there's sections in our act called the wills variation sections. It used to be its own act, and now it's a section within the wills estates and succession act that discussed what happens if a child or a spouse feels that the estate plan is being brought to court treats them unfairly, and that is you're off to the litigation route, okay? Uh, if they've worked with us, there's going to be a trust in place, or through the corporate structure, there's going to be a dual will uh, structure set up, whereby there's a personal will and a corporate will, and the assets held within the corporations are never brought to court, and they're uh, shielded from challenge in that way. And that's a tremendous... And they can be shielded? Yes, absolutely. And it's a very good way to plan how to reward, in particular, that child who gave up whatever their real dream was to work on the farm for 40 years or 30 years or whatever. Or it, just a pract practicality uh, to avoid paying some probate fees to our provincial government. And um, it works like a charm. So to simplify what otherwise sounds like complicated litigation words, if you plan to distribute your estate unequally, meaning 
certain percentages or certain value assets to one child, not another, um, that should trigger for the person a larger conversation with a lawyer about how do I protect this estate from a wills variation challenge. So what do you, what we're saying is there's a legislation that entitles a beneficiary mm -hmm. to challenge the as a distribution of the estate if they feel that they were treated unfairly. Now, if those assets, say, for example, flow outside of the estate mm -hmm. through joint tenants with a right of survivorship or in a trust or other structures that you look at, corporate wills, there are tools, planning tools that can shield you from a wills variation claim. Now, if you just drafted a simple will that said, this farm to my son, this building to my other son, nothing to my daughter, or nominal amount to my daughter, right? There's an unequal distribution that will give rise to potential claims under WESA, the act that Tim mentioned. So it's the triggering event for someone is, I wanna distribute this, but it's gonna be a little bit unequal. How do I go about this? Good planning needs to happen. Good conversation with your lawyer. Do you see them, the the parents usually get the, the the next generation involved and having an open table conversation? Or do you have you seen it more where parents will come in and say, hey, this is kind of what we're thinking. This is what we want to do. Protect it. Or this is our wishes. There, there are kind of two dynamics. One is the open discussion. Yeah. The other is, uh, suppose there's some underlying tension. The parents know there's the underlying tension and the parents are saying, okay, we, we've come to our decision. This is what we're going to do. And you take instructions, the lawyers do, from the person doing the will, doing the estate plan, the mother and the father. Yeah. Uh, another scenario that comes up a lot is you have a child with issues and you want to care for them, but you don't want them to have money. Yeah. Maybe that child uh, likes to gamble. Maybe that child has experienced troubles with uh, different substances in this world that they shouldn't have gotten involved with, but they are. You can set up a testamentary trust within the will whereby you have funds that are there for that child, but that child's never going to control those funds. There's a trustee appointed within the will structure, or perhaps in a trust all by itself, so that somebody can take care of that child and not have him or her fritter it away. So do, what Tim's talking about. what they suffer from. But would that be counsel? Would it be part of the family member? Would it be a third party? How would that look? Uh, a trustee. It's a trustee, so it would be independent. Uh, it can be a family member who's a trustee. It can be a trust company, although I wouldn't recommend it for that because it's very personal. Yeah. Uh, very typically, it's a sibling. Okay. Um, if they choose the smart, good uncle, you're going to run into the problem that the uncle is the same generation, typically, as the parents. And they're going to hit all the problems of old age right about the crisis time that they need to be vigorous and strong enough to handle this for the child with issues. So what Tim's talking about is sometimes someone's plan is just, I want to une unequally distribute and I want to leave one child out to get all this money all at once because I think that they'll be destructive in their personal lives. Yeah. So if they leave them out completely and give it all to the responsible children, that you know black sheep child will be walking into someone's office and saying, I want to bring a wills variation claim, right? So planning tool. Tim brought up an example yeah. of a trust, right, where they will be provided for. Equal yeah, and it just might be that it's not coming all out at once. It provides for them to make sure they have a roof over their head or a certain amount of living allowance. Uh, allowance. Yeah. You yeah. got it. But these are these are the issues that that come up. You know, it's such a sophisticated uh, conversation. I'll give you another example. I'm sure Tim deals with all the time. You have a meeting with a husband and wife. The conversation goes really well. They describe their intentions together, and Tim is given you know the instructions to start drafting this. And the wife says, "Can I just have a side conversation with Tim briefly?" And the husband leaves the room, and she says to him, "That's completely not what I want to do." <laughs> so, what, you get what that do quite I often? do now, Tim? It happens. <laughs> then you then you have to choose your horse, and you, <laughs> and you say, "I'm sorry, I can't act for you both. You have a fundamental disagreement yeah. on what." what you wish to have, have occur. And uh, you, know, you guys, it's, it's, a, 
it, you know, people talk about just create the estate, create a will. It's a tough gig. Um, I know my family, we went through it. It took three, four years. Like there's a lot to discuss, a lot of planning, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, playing out certain situations and scenarios. Yep. Um, and that is the key. Like, what if this happened? How would this play out? What if that happened? How? And those discussions unravels a lot of things that nobody wants to talk about. Mm-hmm. And when that gets on the table, sometimes having those discussions is not a meeting. It's like a back and forth for a couple of weeks and then coming back and be like, okay, now this makes sense, that makes sense. And off to the next topic and that's just a cycle. It might lead to some kind of mediation Yeah. in actuality. Yeah. Um, the other thing that people do is they think about when they're at the stage where they're ready is they think about doing gifting. Yes. They give to some of their children while they're alive. While they're alive. I'm starting to see that more often just because of how housing the cost of housing is so much where they're saying hey i'm gonna sell this i'm gonna piece this off i'm gonna buy you a house buy you a house and then just kind of while they're alive if i may but when they do that i want them to see me or someone like me so Mm -hmm. we do up a deed of gift and we make it very clear that this was intentional that the parent knew what they were doing and you also have the discussion with the parent okay what's going on with everybody else interesting because you want to have things done that are documented, mm-hmm. um, be, the, the disaster is they, they, they just put a child on in jointure, joint ownership with the parent on one or more of their properties as a convenience. And then later the child takes, well, mom and dad gave it to me. Yeah. Well, obviously. It's mine. I mean, it's mine. Yeah. There are such interesting issues. So one, one I'll share with you is, um, you know, some people say, well, if, if you prepare a will, and you leave someone out, for example, say a South Asian family that leaves a daughter out of the estate, that they write some additional language in the will or an additional piece of paper saying, for cultural reasons, I have appointed uh, all of my estate to my son or sons, and I've left out my daughter. So famously, that has, you know, been before our courts, right? This very, I'm doing it, and the person had a sincere belief, sincere belief, that they were following a cultural tradition and that this is what they wanted to do and that this is how their family has done it for generations. It's in BC, so they're hoping that that would be justifiable. What happens in court when the daughter challenges it? BC judge says, sorry, not in this country, not in this province. We have legislation here that will provide for your children because you have a moral and ethical responsibility to provide for your children and the judge will literally cross that line out of the will yeah. and then distribute it depending on the facts of the case potentially equally it's not always precisely equally but they are looking the judge is looking to get close to equal is there a statute of limitation of like how like say if it, this happened um like you said it's a cultural thing so even the sister would think hey i'm not entitled to anything Five years down the line, 10 years down the line, can they still go back and claim? Very good question. So the technical wills variation claim has to be brought within 180 days of probate being granted. Now, does that mean that there are not other types of claims in law that she could bring five years after the fact? You'd have to come get some advice. We'd have to learn the facts. It wouldn't be as clean and easy as a wills variation claim because it's that variation legislation that really gives them the sword, right? Mm -hmm. But there's other little nuanced areas of the law that can get you some fairness in a situation where you were treated unfairly. But again, time periods, facts, scenarios, right? Yeah, don't sit on your rights. (laughs) If you're in the position to challenge, don't sit on your rights. I I just think some of them are just not aware that they have that right. So it's, it's been passed, it's culturally uh, embedded in in generational generation to generation that the sons do get yeah you, you raise an interesting issue yeah. I, in india they've it's even common. they've you know been liberal with getting women their rights um we know about this legislation in bc yeah. um you know the the firm our firm has been on a education front to make sure people are aware of these risks right um if they want to do their planning so, so just having awareness is what's key here because people are headed down this path yeah. mm-hmm. not knowingly, 
right? And uh, they need good advice. For example, we would say, don't go to notary, right? Don't go to Walmart will, don't go to chat GPT to draft your will. <laughs> that GPT is pretty good now. <laughs> AI and, legal and law is, could be an interesting podcast on its own, yes. right? But all those things I talked about, yeah. you know, to have that better sophisticated planning where Definitely. lawyers know about the case law, yeah. the legislation, that additional counselor-like role, digging for those interests in the family. I think it's that counsel role that plays a big, big part of stick handling this whole process. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If it felt too easy, meaning the Walmart will, the one you grab from the funeral home, the notary where it was, oh, that was easy. Do people still do that? Oh, baby. <laughs> people do everything, right? People get stuff off the internet. You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. It's it's some precedent from, you know, in the States, typically. Yeah. It's it's a good will in California. Well, that may be, but it's not California law. No. Uh, they know nothing about our BC legislation. And moreover, they didn't get any advice about all these other planning strategies there are. Um, and so, okay, they spent $50 on their will and lost $100,000 on what they could have saved. So the, the litigation stuff is what gets really interesting. This stuff we could talk about forever, but imagine people in their old age where what we're seeing is elder abuse. Yeah. So what that means is someone who's starting to lose some of their capacity, a caretaker starts coming into their home to be involved in their care. They start to really like this person. And something happens where they end up at a notary office where a bunch of their estate went to the caretaker. Right? If you can imagine. I've heard stories. Eh? So, oh, yeah. You can imagine caretaker. You can imagine where one sibling who's a little bit closer with a parent yeah, takes that. them to some office somewhere under duress and pressure, right? Using family history, family pressure gets them to do things that they would otherwise not do. So, in the litigation, there's all these defenses, these swords and these shields that need to be, you know, advanced for people where an estate plan may have been done, but it was done under duress. Mm -hmm. So then you're challenging the validity of the will, whether they even had capacity to do what they did, right? So there's all these little nuanced things that happen. It's really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it's really sad to see um, the older generation get taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. The classic right? pattern is they've done a, a good plan with someone like us, and they've refined it over a number of years. And then there's a gap, they think they're done. And then the scenario happens. That's the kind of situation where it's likely because they did the planning earlier when they were robust and strong and fully with, with it, that's more likely to stand up to this latecomer will done in the last few months of their lives. Last few months, last week before they die, right? Yeah. I, I have done wills with clients at the hospital it's extremely uncomfortable because you're thinking, okay, I think I've got it. I always get my medical opinion that this person is still able to give me right. this, these instructions. That's right. And I check, do they still have a discerning mind? Do they know what's going on in, in their family? Can they basically describe their estate? And then I'll do it and I'll go back to the office and I will dictate a long memo about everything I can possibly remember about that situation to say, I think I have a true will, but I know I might be a witness yeah. in a trial. What, that, what happens there is if I'm on the other side of the file, I have one of the first things I ask for is the planning solicitor's file. Yep. And we'll get those notes yep. of what was happening under those timelines, yep. right? If he's in the right state of mind. Yep. <laughs> and what the lawyer said and did and what yep. instructions they yep. got. And then yep. that is what we can use for cross-examination and for proving what my clients claims might be an allegation. Far, far better. They got advice, stuck to a plan, central yes. plan, and kept to it, That's right? That is the key. Far better. These farming cases are really, really interesting. There's this, this leading case that comes out of Richmond, and I'll simplify it, right? But imagine two sons, two daughters. Parents pass, and then let's say there's one really big farm. Maybe there's a couple. In this scenario of that case, there was a few farms that the family had grown over the years, okay? The daughters, what they did is they actually wanted to go get an education. They wanted to go to university. One wanted to be a nurse. One wanted to go do some other job. And every time they'd enroll or want to enroll, 
Dad would say, but it's berry season, but it's farm time. And those girls would, you know, put their goals and ambitions on hold, come and contribute to the family's farm and a growth of their estate. At the end, the parents left the farms and all the assets to the two boys mm -hmm. equally and left out their two daughters. So we, in this case, see all the evidence play out this way. And it was very much so on the judge's mind that not only did these young women contribute to the growth of the asset, they didn't get to advance their own personal asset, meaning their education, yeah. so that they can in their own lives, yeah. if their marriages didn't work out, have jobs and be independent. So you end up with potentially women who are so far behind in life, mm -hmm. right? But they gave their lives to their families estate yeah. yep. right in that classic case out of the two boys the two sons one actually of them wanted to share equally but it was the executor eldest son that said no so you end up in a court case because one of the two sons runs it through the litigation right so i'm familiar with that case because i was the listing agent and i actually brought my buyer to that oh boy and i did i wasn't fully aware of the situation i was hired by the executor interesting did my job sold it, and then I saw it in the paper six months later. Yeah, the litigation. Yeah, and it was one of, one of, one of the first ones where you see in the news, the headlines, right? South Asian family and WESA, right? The act in, in action. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful read because the judge, it's such a difficult position to be in as a judge because a lot of these memories and histories, right, have to come out through these witnesses and memories yep. could fade. Yep. But you try to get your best sense of what happened and what, is the right thing to do, Yeah. right? The right thing to do. Definitely. And uh, there's there's lots of them that are that are like that. And we face them all the time. Just yesterday, someone came into my office, yeah. right? Two sons, one daughter, and she said, here's the will. It was a two-pager. Oh no. It was a two-pager <laughs> that said, this property to this son, this property to that son, and I've provided enough to my daughter through her life, nothing to her, yeah. right? Oh. And, I oh. said, tell me more about provided, uh, you know, through your life. Did Was there a dowry? Did he give you a down payment on a home? Right? What's the backstory here? And she's like, nothing. But you know what? Lovely person who said, I actually love my brothers. And I do not want this to turn into a high conflict. I think most don't. I think it, no one wants to create a problem. But they also want, they also have a life that they're going to live. They also have children. They also are trying to set up their yeah. future. So I don't think a lot of them don't have the intention to stir the pot. They just, they want to, they want to make it amicable, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know what, guys, I want to really, really thank you for coming out. Do you guys have any final thoughts for our audience? Okay. Uh, I'll go first. My final thought or a thought, I might have another final thought. <laughs> Get advice. Definitely. Get informed. Learn what you should be doing and do it. Do a plan. Set it up, and as I said, two, three, four years later, look at it again. Does it still work? It never stops being relevant to think about your situation. It never stops being the right thing to do to figure out, is it still working? It's like exercise. I don't always want to exercise. In fact, often I don't. That's why I look like this and Perminder looks like that. I don't want to exercise, but I know I'm going to have a better life if I do it. Definitely. And the same with planning uh, like this, this uh, estate planning uh, situation. If you just let it drift, it's not going to work. Yeah, I agree. That's my thought. Yeah, my, my thought will be a litigation focus sort of statement is that triggering thought should be if there's going to be an unequal distribution of your estate, you need to pause and you need to seek advice and determine through people like Tim how am I going to ensure my wishes are honored and protect myself, create various shields from a wills variation claim? Mm -hmm. Wills variation claims are anticipated to be the largest sort of next litigation that our courts are going to be filled with yes. through this transition of, of the wealth. Well, how can our audience get a hold of you guys? So Lindsay Kenny, you can find at two offices out of downtown Vancouver mm -hmm. at 401 West Georgia. Um, near Library Square, and then we have a Langley office at 8621-201 Street. So that's right near 200th and the number one freeway. Um, so we have our two offices that are fully staffed with two 
fully operational, full service firm. So we don't just do estate work. We do corporate stuff, uh, family law, um, other general litigation, criminal law, personal injury, um, and www.lklaw.ca is the is the email address. You can reach me at tgreer at lklaw.ca, uh, 604-888-5811. That's the general reception line, and it'll be put through to me. Yeah, and Perminder Tung, P. Tung at lklaw.ca, same phone number, based out of the Langley office. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.